day and we're just thankful for the men as they come together to discuss these important things. This morning I wanted to get back into our uh, series on approaching God through His Word. You might recall that we were talking about in our first lesson this idea of God's silence and how a lot of people mock at that, think that we simply have created that, that it's not in the Bible. But we showed very clearly that concept is in the Bible that God's silence does say something, that it is restrictive and not permissive. It is something that needs to be respected as we try to please God through his word. In our second lesson, we talked about what we call the biblical hermeneutic. Basically, how do we derive what we do? How do we interpret these scriptures? And we talked about command, example, and necessary inference or conclusion. And we learned that not only is that in the Bible, that that's how God expects us to, to obey him, but that's basically how we learn anything in our modern day world. And so today I wanted to start lesson three, basically asking this question, if I want to use God's word, if I want to learn how to obey him and be pleasing to him, where do I start? I mean, let's face it, that this Bible for a lot of people is just a massive load of pages and stories and information and, and some just stop right there. Others have taken the approach that we know is not the right approach, but at some point in their life, they figure out, okay, I need God, and, and I need a message from God. And so they'll take their Bibles, and they'll just generically open, just like randomly open, and point. And wherever they point, they read that passage... And then they derive some personal message from that passage. And they attribute that to God. Well, we know that that's not the right approach because in that type of approach, God becomes kind of like a, a, a source or fortune teller. And in reality, it's not God that's speaking to you. You're speaking to yourself with your self-interpretation of whatever you just Read. So where do I start? Where do I find these right commands that apply to me today? Well, where do I find the examples that I need to follow today? Well, I think that as I look at the religious world, I think pretty much everyone understands that not all commands in the Bible are for today, or what we might say are binding. For example, in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we have a command from God. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. God giving that expectation, giving that command that Adam is to keep the garden. He is to cultivate it, to care for it. I know of no church... That tells us that to be pleasing to God, you have to have a garden and you have to keep it and cultivate it. And no, nobody does that. They understand that that was for Adam and that was for that period of time. It is not binding today. In like manner, I don't know of any church that goes to Genesis 6.14 that says, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And says, listen, if you want to be pleasing to God today, you've got to build an ark. You've got to go down to Home Depot. You've got to go get some gopher wood. I don't know how you would do that. And you've got to get the glue and you've got to get the nails. And you've got to start building this ark. There's no church that does that because we understand that that was for Noah's time. And that was for Noah and his family. That was his plan of salvation. Not for our time. I don't know of any church that goes to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 and says, listen, to be pleasing to God, we have to do what Abram did. We got to pick up our family and we got to go to some land that God shows us and we've got to live as pilgrims and strangers there. And I mean that in a physical, literal sense. 
Obviously, there is a spiritual sense of us being pilgrims and strangers and aliens in the world we live. You see, people understand that when you look at that Old Testament, when we look at the book of Genesis, we, those commands are not for us today. Nobody is commanding them. You say, well, well, Brother Brent, why are you telling us this? Well, because we get to a certain part of that Old Testament, and all of a sudden, those commands become for today's commands. And I want to show you that's just not the right place. That's the wrong place. We understand in some areas, but in other areas, some in the religious world don't understand. Where's the right place? So here's our question. If I've got someone that is new to the Bible and I'm studying with them, I want them to, to, to ask this question. Okay, so what do I need to do? How do I find that right place for, for me to, to find the right commands, the right examples? What do we need to do? Well, I think what we need to do is we need to open up God's Word and we need to look at the history of the Bible and, and look at it with this, this view how did God rule his creation? How did God rule? In other words, we're going to be looking for his law, his commandments. We're going to ask how. How did he give that law? We're going to ask when. That's important in this. When did he give that law, right? Well, he, he gave the, the, the building of the ark. He gave that command in the days of Noah, not today. Who did he give it to? Those are all important questions. And so as we start looking at the history, as we start looking at how God deals with and, and rules and guides mankind, as we look at his laws and his commands, we're also going to be looking for a change in the law. All of a sudden, God changes the law. And we're going to be asking these questions, why? Why does God now deal with mankind in a different way? We're going to be asking, when? When does that change take place? Who? Is that change for? And so let's go ahead and start doing that as we talk about the beginning of the Bible. There's a period of time that God works with mankind in a certain way. And we call this period of time the patriarchal dispensation. Now I want you, I want my friend to know as we're starting to study, this is a, a, this is a title... This is a, a, a description that we have come up with. The Bible doesn't talk about the patriarchal dispensation. It doesn't call it that. But this is a way that we distinguish what we see taking place at a certain place in the Bible, a certain time of the Bible. And because God is dealing with the fathers, and that's what the term patriarch means, we call it that, the, the, the period of the fathers, the patriarchal dispensation. Call it what you want. But I think that is a good title, even though it's not a biblical title. So where is this patriarchal period of time? Well, it's in the book of Genesis. As you're reading the book of Genesis, you are reading how God is dealing with the people of that time during this patriarchal dispensation. And so basically what we would say is we, we see God dealing with mankind this way from creation all the way to Mount Sinai. And so we kind of have this span of time we're looking at and we're asking our questions. And what is interesting is that God is dealing with his creation in two different ways. Everyone of his creation. He is ruling them. He is guiding them. He is judging them by what we might say is an unwritten law. It's not written on parchment. It's not written on stone. It's not written on some type of material that man can look at and read. But it is written in a way. It's written inside us. It's written in our hearts. Some people refer to this as the moral law of God. Some refer to it as the patriarchal law. Call it what you will. There is this law pre-programmed in us of right versus wrong. Now, does everybody 
agree with what's right versus what's wrong. No, because some have taken the, pre pre the program and rewritten it. But from the beginning, we're all created with this moral law, right from wrong. And as you look at the patriarchal period, we see God judging mankind from an unwritten law. From this moral code pre-programmed in us to do what's right and to restrain ourselves from what is wrong. We see the, the whole story of Noah and the flood comes about because of this. We see Sodom and Gomorrah is brought upon this terrible judgment of God because of an unwritten law that's written in our lives, in our hearts. But God also works with mankind in a second way. All of mankind? No. Certain ones. He has a secondary way. A second law, if you will. And certain fathers and certain families, God comes to them and he gives them commands that aren't for everyone else. Build an ark. Move to Canaan. And so what we see is that God works through certain families, giving them certain commands for them, for the father, for the family. And so we look at this period of time as a period where God expects men to worship him basically through the family. The, the father, in a way, becomes the spiritual leader, or some might say the priest, He's the one that builds the altars and offers the animal sacrifice. But this is a period of time that we see that these fathers and these families, not everybody, but, but, but these particular families, what? Well, look at, look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal, of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. It seems safe to say that at some point God commanded Noah to do that. And that this was something that he was accustomed to do with himself and his family. And so God has a special law and a special relationship with Noah and his family. But then we go over to Abraham in Genesis 12 verse 7. And we see Abraham, a descendant of Noah, doing the exact same thing. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, notice the direct communication. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, your, to your descendants, I will give this land. And so what does he do? The same thing Noah. The same thing Noah did. He built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. And so we see throughout the book of Genesis, God dealing in these two ways. God guiding and, and working through and judging people through these two ways. Until we get to the time of Moses. And all of a sudden, as Moses gets on the scene, we start to notice things begin to change. God starts guiding men in a different direction. All men? No. But a certain group. Not one family, but several families. And so now God doesn't speak through the fathers. God speaks through Moses. And he speaks through Moses not to one family, but to one nation. And so God starts dealing with people, at least one particular group of people as a nation, a nation that he created, a nation that he had promised. And so things start to change with an exception. Anyone outside this nation, they're still being guided and ruled and judged by that unwritten law. And so God takes this nation like he did Noah, like he did Abraham, like he did Isaac. And he says, now I'm going to deal with you, but as a family nation, I'm going to deal with you as my nation. You're going to have a special law, a different law. And so Moses starts leading them to Mount Sinai where a new law is given. We got to take notice of that. Things start to change. The law starts to change. A new law is given. And now what? The law is written down. Written down on material. 
written down, at least part in stone. And so now what is pre-programmed in us is now also written down in the law. But the law is not just that. It's all encompassing. There is the, the religious law, or what some call the ceremonial law. There is the criminal law. See, this whole idea that, that we live under about the separation of church and state, that is not from God. That was not God's purpose. Here he has a nation, and it's all-encompassing. God's law is the law of the state, the law of the land. And this law is not given to a father. It's given to Moses. We might call him a mediator. God speaks to the people but he speaks to them through Moses. Moses being called up several times up to Mount Sinai to be given the commands, to be given this law, and to bring it down to the people, not only to write it, but to also speak it to the people. And so we see this change of a national religion. And so as we want to find out, where, where do we go? Well, we notice this difference, right? Right? the patriarchal period, and then over here we have what? Mount Sinai and the Mosaic period. And notice the differences. No written law versus the written law. Speaking to the fathers, speaking to the mediator Moses. Speaking directly, here speaking only directly to Moses. A family religion versus a national religion. And so what we have to do is we have to understand that if we're living over here, we're not going to go back over here and find our commands. If we're living over in this period of time, this is our commands. This is what we follow. This is how we please the Lord. And so as Paul says in the King James Version, 2 Timothy 1.15, we need to rightly divide the Word of God. And so we're going to use that crossing of the Red Sea. And that's what this water represents. The crossing of the Red Sea as this division, this dividing mark between what was and what is now. And what is interesting, as I said from the very beginning, most religious people understand, yeah, we're not going back here. That's from a different time. We divide, we cut that off. But now as we move forward... People are under that Mosaic law for a long time, many, many years. There's a lot of biblical history between the, the, the time of the judges to the time of the kings, the united kingdom to the divided kingdom, the, the, the time where they're living in the land of Canaan to the time where they live in captivity. But eventually what happens is Jesus comes. And as we start to read in the Bible, Jesus comes, well, it's kind of like Moses. Things begin to change. God now starts to speak, not through the law, the law of Moses, but now he starts to speak to the people through Jesus. And then through the apostles and the prophets. And in fact, there's, there's at least a couple occasions while Jesus is still on the earth that he sends his apostles out. To preach the good news. To preach about the, the new commands that are coming. And so God now starts breaking down the barrier wall. Where there was Israel and there was everyone else. Where there were the Jews and there were the Gentiles. And that's what this is all about. What, what God intended from the very beginning is to bring everyone together under one law. Under one umbrella. The law of Christ. And so now we're not dealing with mankind from a national perspective. Now we're dealing with mankind internationally. The law of Christ is for everybody. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your, your skin color or your language. Jesus Christ is for all. And Jesus is not leading us to the waters of the Red Sea. He's not making us cross some physical river. Jesus is leading the people to the waters of baptism. And so in a way, and Paul even talks about this in 1 Corinthians 10, there's a crossing of one life to another life. The old way to the new way that involves water. 
a crossing, a, a washing. And so as we compare these two, again, we've got to do the exact same thing. We've got to go over here and notice that there's the Mosaic Law. And then we're going to use the cross as the dividing mark. And now we're in the Christian period. And the law is written, but it's a new law. In fact, as you go back to the Old Testament, as you go back here, it talks about a new covenant and a new law that's going to be uh, given to mankind. And even though it is written, written down on parchment, it talks about it also, much like all the way back in the, the, the patriarchal period, it talks about it being written in our hearts. It'll be written in our hearts and it'll be written down on paper. And so God speaks through Jesus. He speaks through his prophets, his apostles. But eventually they go and now like he did through the law of Moses, he speaks us through the word, through what we call the gospel. It's not a national religion. It's a international religion religion and so we use that cross because jesus himself says this new covenant this new will and testament doesn't begin until the death of the attestator the death of the one who created and that was jesus christ now this is where we get to the crux of it we understand we don't have to build a garden and cultivate it we don't have to build an ark or move to some foreign land that God shows us. But this is where the confusion in, in, in Christianity exists today. The confusion where some will take, even though we live over here, will take some of that old law, some of that Mosaic law, and bring it over here. That's the wrong place. Those are the wrong commands. We can't mix these two together. We have to make a distinction between the old and the new so that we find the right place and the right commands and the right examples to please the Lord in the right way. And why do we want to do that? <laughs> we just remember why. Because Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. For us who are imperfect and weak and sinful. And yet he loved us first by going to the cross. We want to obey him in all things according to his will because he loved us first and loved us in ways we could never understand. I don't want us to get so bogged down. And I, I, I tell the teen class this all the time. I don't want to get so bogged down in right versus wrong that we lose sight of the beauty of God and the beauty of Jesus' sacrifice. That's our motivation. And it's a perfect motivation for us to want to do what is right, to approach Him with His Word in the right way. You know, in studying and writing uh, this workbook for um, the, the restoration, one of the things I, I learned is that Alexander Campbell made this, this dawned on him. And this was a very big part of his teaching and his debating. Because he realized that in the denominational secular world, that there was no division between new and old, and that when it was convenient, the old was just blended with the new. And he sat in pulpits in America totally telling people and teaching people, it, there's a difference, there's a distinction, and it's not just something that we're making up. There's passages like Hebrews 7, 11 through 12. Look, now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? What is the Hebrew author talking about? He's talking about as we look at religion today, we see that there's a difference. There's a change in the priesthood. And when we see that difference, that, that tells us something. 
So verse 12, he says, For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of the law also. There's your necessary inference. What do I see? A change in the priesthood. So what do I necessarily have to conclude about that? Then the law is changed also. One stems from the other. And so under today's law, under the law of Christ, we're not under a Levitical priesthood. We have a different high priest, a perfect high priest, a better, as the Hebrew author says, a better high priest who can understand our sin and our weakness. In Galatians 3, 24 and 25, Paul says, or writes, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The law was our tutor. It brought us to Christ. That was its, its purpose. Its purpose was not to be the end of all law. Its purpose was not to, to save us completely. Without the blood of Jesus, it could not do that. But now that faith has come, now that Christ has come, his law, his covenant, that law has gone away. It's fulfilled its purpose. We're no longer with that tutor. Clearly a distinction is being made by Paul as he writes, just as it was made by the Hebrew author. Colossians 2.14, Paul here, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting decrees against us, which was hostile to us. What, what's this? decree what's this thing that consists of decrees the certificate of death th these decrees that are against us that are hostile he's talking about the law the law pointed out our sin the law said you are weak you are imperfect you need something more than the law and so what did jesus do he came and died on the cross and as he died on the cross, he took out that certificate of debt. He took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. There's a distinction and Jesus, or Paul here makes that distinction, the cross. That's the dividing line. And we have to respect that. We have to understand that. And so let's, let me just give you, before we close, let me just give you a couple examples here. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about this very important day. What day is important to God? Well, in the Old Testament, on the law of Moses, we know it was the Sabbath day. We see that very clearly taught. And that Sabbath day was clearly taught as the seventh day of the week. And isn't interesting? There's no distinction in the old law that says, well, the Sabbath is the first Saturday of each month. No, it says the Sabbath is the seventh day. And they understood every week has a seventh day. Every seventh day of every week is the Sabbath day. They observe the Sabbath day every week. Every seventh day. Uh, we know that it's described as a day of rest. You're not supposed to go out there and work. And buy and sell and trade like you would on a normal work day. It's a day of rest as it's described. And we're not going to take the time to read these, but you can make note of them and you can read them. These are passages that describe the very things we have up here. And notice where those passages are. They're all in the Old Testament. They're under the old law. But under the New Testament, under the new law... We see the change. What John referred to in the book of Revelation chapter 1 as being in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And what we come to understand that that's the first day of the week in the Bible, Sunday. And why do we worship God? Why do we gather every Sunday for the Lord's Supper? Well, one of these things that we're making a conclusion, the same thing. Every seventh day was the Sabbath in the old law. Why is it any different on the law of Christ when it comes to the Lord's Day, the first day of the week? And so we, as we try to get back to the Bible, as we try to approach God with His Word, 
We gather every Lord's Day, every Sunday, and we observe the Lord's Supper. Just as we see in Acts 20 and in verse 7. But this is not a day of rest. This is a day of worship. This is a day where we come to, to gather and to worship. You say, well, second, that's what they did. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they, while we're resting, we're going to have fellowship with God. That's perfectly fine. But the emphasis is that this was a day of rest. Here, there's no emphasis on a day of rest. It's a day of worship. A day where we come together for the Lord's Supper and to give of our means. As we're doing that, we also do those other acts of worship in honor and reverence to God. And here's those passages that show these specific days. And again, notice where they're at. They're in the New Testament. Now, there are certain churches who call themselves Christian churches. Who follow Jesus Christ. At least that's what they claim. But when you look at what they do, they observe not Sunday, they observe Saturday. They observe the Sabbath. There's a day of rest. That's what they command their members. Sunday is just an ordinary day. But to them, the Sabbath day is so very special. Well, that's the wrong place. And that's the wrong day. And so when we go to the wrong place and we look at the wrong commands, then we're not going to be approaching God properly. And we need to understand that. Understand how to rightly divide the word of God. All right, let's give one more example here. Let's talk a little bit about the priesthood. The Hebrew author talked about it. It's a great example the priesthood. Well, in the old law, there was what we might call a specialized priesthood. You could be a child of God, but not be a priest. All priests were Israelites. Not all Israelites were priests. In fact, we could even go as far as say this. All priests were from the tribe of Levi, but not all of Levi were priests. Only a handful within a certain family were given that designation, and even certain ones in that family could not serve as priest. It was truly specialized. What did these priests do? Well, one, they wore special garments. There's a, a, a few chapters in the book of Exodus that talk about the making of those garments, and then more chapters about them, what? Actually making the garments. How to make them, and then actually making them and putting them on the priest so that they are distinguished from everyone else. And they were mediators of animal sacrifices. There was other things they did, obviously, but when we think about the Old Testament priests, this is one of the things we think about, that they help people to make sacrifices as offerings to God. And they were mediators. They would inquire of God for the people. David often came to the high priest and asked him, before I go into battle, will you inquire of God for me? They were mediators of the law. They, they taught people the law. They were judges of the law. And so they were in very much kind of like Moses, mediators. And they need to be ordained. They needed to be consecrated. The Bible talks about there were certain things that they had to do in order to serve as a priest. And there was a period of time where they reached an age where they could serve. And prior to that age, they could not. And there was a certain age where they could no longer. They had to retire. In every single way, it was a very specialized, a very distinguished priesthood. But as we go to the New Testament, again, as the Hebrew author says... It's a change. It's no longer specialized in the sense that God's people, some are and some aren't. No, it's a spiritual priesthood. That if you are a child of God under, under his new covenant, you're a priest. Jesus Christ is the high priest. We serve our high priest. If you're a priest, you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're a priest. That's the change we see being made. And we don't wear special garments. 
We're clothed with Christ. I remember growing up in the, the Lutheran church. And in the Lutheran church, you, you knew who the pastors were because they wore gowns and they had sashes. And, and you, you were distinguished from them. Everyone else looked like you. <laughs> and I remember the first time I went to a church of Christ, not too far from here, down here at Tustin. And I was shocked when the guy that did the sermon got up and he looked like everyone else. I was kind of looking at like, who's the preacher? And the only way I could tell is he got up in the pulpit and started preaching. And different men got up and led prayers and led the songs. I, it was different for me because I grew up in a church that had a specialized priesthood. That went to the Old Testament and formed their organization like the Old Testament priesthood. Um, this is one we're pretty glad of. We don't offer animal sacrifices. But here's the thing. Not only are we the priests, we are the sacrifice. As Hebrews chapter 12 says that we are, our spiritual service is to be a sacrifice. We, we, we sacrifice our time, our energy, our will. And so it's a unique feature that we are the sacrifice as well as the priest. And we are not mediators. Jesus Christ is our mediator. As Paul says in Timothy, we have one mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you want to talk about ordination and consecration, it's God's plan of salvation which culminates in baptism, which is our commitment to be sanctified, to be separate and apart. So there is a distinction between Christ's priesthood and everyone else. It's just a difference between the church and the world. We clothe ourselves with Christ. And that's the only thing that we have so that people will know that we are a priest. You see, there's a lot of churches today. When you go, it looks a lot more, it looks a lot more like the Old Testament. A priesthood that looks like the law of Moses. A church that, that is organized like the law of Moses. And there's many more examples that we can talk about. But I think these will, will do to understand the importance that we've got to go to the right place to find the right commands and the right examples so that we honor the one that sacrificed everything for us. It's his will and not ours. What I presented to you is something I use quite often in, in my teaching of others. I basically just put in, in a different form this chart, but this chart is all about Dividing the Bible correctly. And I use this early on with my studies because I want people to know, why are we in the, Old, the, the New Testament so much? Why aren't we using the Old Testament that much? Because, well, I want you to understand this is the right place to find the right commands, the right examples, so we have the right way of honoring Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, you need to come and be part of that new covenant, that new way to obey him by the right commands. We're not going to make you cross the Red Sea. We're going to make you cross over into the waters of baptism into a new life. Or maybe we need to bring you into a new relationship with repentance and prayer. Whatever be your need, if you let that be known, as together we stand and as we sing.